Picture this, you've just spent a day exploring on Mars and now you're hungry. What are you gonna eat on a planet where nothing grows and the nearest DoorDash driver is more than 140 million miles away? Today we're going to dive into the wild science of how humans are going to eat on a long-term mission to Mars. Mars is pretty crazy. First up you've got Mount Olympus, which is an extinct volcano that is two and a half times taller than Mount Everest. If you ever wanted to have boasting rights for the most ultimate hike, surely this would be it. But you'd have to deal with some next level extreme conditions. For starters, the air has hardly any oxygen. It's mainly carbon dioxide. So if you were to breathe that in, you would very quickly pass out and that would be it. Not ideal for a hike. The next issue that you'd have to deal with is the extreme temperatures. So the maximum temperature you're gonna get is 20 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which might sound pretty nice. But Mars's atmosphere is so thin that the heat can't stick around. So while your feet might be cozy and warm, your head would literally be freezing. And that's only the beginning because the temperature can drop to minus 143 Celsius or minus 225 Fahrenheit, which is well and truly cold enough to turn some of that carbon dioxide in the air into dry ice. So we're talking extreme, extreme cold conditions. Oh, and then there's also the occasional dust storm that covers the entire planet and it can take months for that dust to settle. And I forgot to mention, it takes nine months to get there. Are we there yet? No! Are we there yet? Yes. Really? No! And if you do land on Mars and you don't like it or something goes wrong, you can't just change your mind and come back to Earth straight away. You have to wait for the Earth and Mars to be in the optimal position close to each other when you attempt to do that. So that means you're going to have to hang out on Mars for about a year and a half waiting for the planets to align and then do the six month return journey back to Earth. Because of all these factors, some people have suggested we should be trying to colonize the moon first instead of Mars because it's not quite so far away. There are so many problems that need to be solved before humans could actually colonize the moon or another planet. But a big puzzle piece in all of this is food. Humans need to eat. Now, obviously we've been going to the International Space Station for some time now, and packing food for those trips is a bit like packing for a hiking trip, just with a much, much bigger budget and a few more constraints. One of the types of food they take is the thermostabilized foods, which are very similar to these military MREs or thermostabilized foods you could get at the shops. Ooh, doesn't look good. Wow. I'm sorry, monsieur, I did not order the baby vomit. Whew. Am I eating just out like this? That's how they do it in space. How you, this is how we roll in space. Yum, delicious. I do like me a curry, that's good. Traveling light is also really important. So a lot of the foods that they take have either been dried or they've been freeze dried to remove most of the water from the product, which not only makes it lighter, it also makes the food last for a lot, lot longer. If you've ever tried freeze dried fruit or freeze dried ice cream before, you'll know how crunchy it is. Freeze dried strawberry. Very crunchy and tasty too. Would you like to try peach? Sure. I've never had freeze-dried peach before and that is not the colour that I was expecting. The texture is weird but it is delicious. I really like peach. You actually can't eat it like that on the International Space Station though. Even if you ripped open the packet, you'd end up with crumbs and powder and dust floating through the air, which people could breathe in, it can go in their eyes, it can interfere with equipment, and 
cause malfunctions, it's just too dangerous. So what they do is they seal them into pouches and then once they're on the space station, when they're ready to eat it, they put it into the machine which has a needle that pierces it and injects in water to rehydrate that food. They can use either warm water or cold water and then they have to mix it around to make sure it's all wet and then leave it to rehydrate before opening it. Millions of peaches. Peaches from me. Oh, that looks like, uh, I don't know what it looks like. Like calamari or something. Oh. Okay. It's a bit, it's got a t consistency a little bit like a tinned apple. Um, definitely not sort of the smooth peach consistency. It's sort of more fibrous, I guess. But the flavor's okay. Rehydrated strawberries are, oh, hmm, different. Freeze dried space ice cream is super popular here on Earth, but not so popular in space. The astronauts will not eat it. That stuff is disgusting. Can you imagine eating that once it's been rehydrated and it's all soggy? Mm, no, thank you. As long as the food is wet and has that sort of soggy consistency, then it will clump together and you won't end up with crumbs and bits everywhere. Watch this as Andreas Mogensen slowly makes a floating ball of juice. He does have to be careful not to let any little drops escape, but it's the surface tension that's holding this ball together and it can withstand some movement and it's pretty cool there. So you can't have any powder or crumbs, but you can have liquid and that's why they use liquid salt and pepper. As long as the food has that wet consistency, it will clump together on your tortilla or on your spoon and make it easy to eat. And they can also have some shelf stable foods that we would have here on earth, even if they're crunchy, as long as they put the whole thing in their mouth so you don't end up with any crumbs. And all of these meals and snacks all get planned and analyzed by dietitians to make sure they're gonna meet all the nutrient requirements of each individual astronaut while they are away in space. And the astronauts do get to taste the food before they go to make sure they're going to like it. One month into the mission and then if you made the wrong decisions, it's it's a it's a hard remaining five months. So last thing that I have for today, after a successful tasting of 48 items. As far as fresh food goes, they don't have much fridge space, so that's going to spoil pretty quickly. But fortunately, at the International Space Station, they do get some treats of fresh food when they get fresh supplies, approximately once a month. And look what we have. In the progress, they gave us some fresh apples. So of course they can't stay very long because we don't have a fridge, but at least a couple of weeks we have some fresh fruit to eat. The International Space Station is actually quite close to Earth, so that's why they can get those resupplies so regularly. But that is not going to be the case if you're on the Moon or on Mars, so fresh produce is going to be a big deal. The other thing that's going to be very different is the microgravity that you just saw with everything floating, including the people, that won't be the same. On the moon, the gravity is about 17% of what we experience here on Earth. So things will feel much, much lighter when you're on the moon, but they are still going to drop towards the surface. David Scott did an experiment where he dropped a hammer and a feather while he was on the moon. And the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our Falcon, and I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? So that's the Moon. What about Mars? Well, on Mars, the surface gravity is about 38% of what we have here on Earth. So again, things will feel lighter, but they will still fall. So crumbs are not going to be as big an issue as they are at the International Space Station. In case you're wondering why then is everybody floating and all the things floating on the International Space Station, that's not because of gravity. In fact, their gravity is about 90% of what we experience on the Earth. If the International Space Station was to stop and stand still, that gravity would pull it down and it would crash into the Earth. But if you add a horizontal movement, the trajectory changes. And if you move fast enough horizontally, 
then as it falls, it misses the Earth. But because gravity is still pulling it towards Earth, it doesn't just float off into space, it keeps free falling and orbits around the Earth. The ISS is actually traveling at eight kilometers per second, and it orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. So it's going super fast. Even with that speed, it does tend to come back towards the Earth and has to have a little boost every now and then to keep it out in orbit. So if you are on Mars or on the surface of the moon, you're not going to have as many issues with crumbs as they do on the International Space Station. But because Mars is so far away and you're going to have to be there for so long, you're going to have to take a huge volume of food in order to have enough to eat for that length of time. And that is a big issue. So obviously people are thinking for other solutions, like maybe you could grow your food when you get to Mars. But that is not as easy as it sounds. For starters, you don't get as much sunlight on Mars because it's further away from the sun. So you only get 43% of the amount of sunlight and plants need sunlight to grow. They use photosynthesis to make sugar to fuel all of the growth in them. So you're going to have to add some artificial lighting to make that even a possibility. But despite not having as much sunlight, they have far more UV because they don't have an ozone layer around Mars like we do. And the very high amounts of UV radiation are just going to fry the plants and cause DNA mutations and issues and not going to be good for humans either. So you're going to need to farm in a greenhouse or underground in caves to protect from that UV. And your greenhouses would have to be completely sealed in so that you can control the temperature and also have the air and the air pressure correct in there so that it's optimal for plants to grow. And then there's the soil. What are you going to plant plants in? In the Martian movie, he planted it into the soil from Mars. And he did so while he was just wearing shorts and a t-shirt. But the soil on Mars contains perchlorite salts at levels that are so high they're toxic to humans and plants. On top of that, the soil lacks the essential nutrients that the plants need to grow. Now, in the movie, he added human waste to try and use that as fertilizer. And while that would bacterially not be ideal, nutrient-wise for the plant, it could help, but it wouldn't be enough. Another issue is that the soil is so fine, it repels the water instead of absorbing it. So it seems like there are endless problems. Are there any possibilities that could work? Well, they are looking into things like hydroponics, where you grow plants in water and you don't use soil at all. That could be a possibility. They're also researching genetically modifying plants because even if they're in a greenhouse, those conditions would still be very extreme compared to what we have here on Earth. So if they take genes from bacteria that is in ice in Antarctica that can survive there and a different gene from a tomato that grows high up in the mountains in the Andes so it's a bit more UV resistant and put that into a different plant, hopefully then it will be a little bit more resistant to the extreme conditions. Also, they're looking at how they can have plants that are smaller but with a higher yield so you don't need as much space in the greenhouse to get the most amount of food possible. They're also looking at things like lichen, algae and bacteria that might be able to survive such extreme conditions. So far with plants, most of the research has found some that can tolerate and survive one of the extreme conditions. And I'm not saying they thrive, they're just surviving one of the extreme conditions. But once you add in multiple extreme conditions like the UV and the perchlorites and lower gravity and everything else that's going on, then the number that survive is dropping rapidly. Nothing's surviving all of it, in other words. So it's looking like for an initial visit to Mars, if humans are going to go, they are going to have to take all their food with them from Earth. And as we said, that's a very large volume. So for that to be possible, the food's probably going to have to be transported to Mars ahead of when the humans go to Mars. Now, if you think about back to the orbit and the planets needing to line up, the timing of that means that by the time they are on their return journey back to Earth, that food will be nearly five years old. Microbially, that's fine. We can have food that lasts that long. But in terms of 
flavor and texture and color and even nutrients chemical changes still happen in that food over time and it degrades over time. So having food that's still palatable after that long is an issue that's needing research at the moment. I know when they've done studies with soldiers in the past, if food wasn't palatable, they would still eat it. They'd eat enough to survive, but they're not going to eat enough to thrive, which is an issue when you need people to be at the top of their game and not making any mistakes. They need to be just eating enough food to thrive on that return mission. So there is a lot of research that has to go in in that area. And you need not just a few foods, you need a big variety of foods that has already been shown to be an issue on the International Space Station. Right now, we have about 180 food items on International Space Station, and that seems to be, well, and then we have another 100 or so items from Russia and some more from Europe. So, so we're probably at about a 300 number. Um, and that seems to be the right number for a six-month mission. Even with that much variety on the ISS and the fact that they send more food than is needed, most astronauts still come back having lost weight. They just lose interest in food. And a lot of them say it's because they feel very stuffed up from the microgravity, stuffing up all their sinuses and their nose, so it may not taste quite the same. But not everybody says that is the issue, but certainly they are wanting different foods when they get home. So for a longer mission, that's going to be even more complex, which is part of the reason why they're doing the Chapir studies where they are simulating a Mars landing environment and putting volunteers or locking volunteers into this environment for more than a year. I told the crew the other day that at 378 uh, days in, I didn't feel like, uh, you know, this could have been any day beyond 10 or at most 11 years since we came in last June. <laughs> Studying the food that is supplied and eaten by the people as they are in there for a year or just over a year is a really important part of Chapir. That's why one of the principal investigators on that is a food scientist. And you may have seen in some of the images that they were growing plants and that they had even picked some food to eat. While that's important, it's not enough. They can't get enough volume to make a real nutritional impact. It's more being looked at as if it will give a psychological benefit and also if it'll give a little bit more variety. For example, if I grow microherbs, these ones have only been planted a few days ago and they're already this big. Being able to add some of this to your meal would add a little bit of freshness and hopefully take out a bit of the boredom that you might get from having the same food repeatedly. What do you think? Would you go on a mission to Mars? And if you did, what food would you miss the most? With thanks to my amazing patrons for all of your support, you're much appreciated. Make it a great week by being kind to others and I'll see you on Friday.